Good morning to our friends in Seoul and good evening to those here in the U.S. It's a great pleasure to be part of this year's Korea Global Forum for Peace, an incredible gathering of experts on a range of issues impacting the future of the Korean Peninsula. It's a shame we can't get together in person in Seoul as of yet, um, but hopefully we'll be able to do this again in the future. Um, I'm Jenny Town. I'm a senior fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C., and director of 38 North. Um, our panel tonight aims to discuss the public health situation in North Korea and ways to build cooperation, international cooperation in this important sector. Um, if we've learned anything over the past two years, it's that a weak public health system and response can have global implications and that everyone has a part to play. North Korea's system is wholly inadequate to deal with the kind of COVID outbreak we've seen in other countries, including both South Korea, which was a relatively mild case, um, and in the U.S., which has been generally about a public health disaster. Um, so this has led to deep paranoia in Pyongyang and prolonged national isolation, which seemingly has been effective in preventing a, a major epidemic epidemic in the country, um, but it's come at a huge socioeconomic cost as well, the effects of which are still revealing themselves. However, building cooperation with North Korea, especially on humanitarian and public health, can be a difficult proposition, given the political constraints of the Kim regime's suspicions, preferences and protocols, the North's international reputation, and a history of politicizing humanitarian and development aid and assistance. What we'd like to do tonight is discuss how to break through some of these constraints, especially in the public health sector, with a special focus on areas ripe for cooperation, for which we've historically seen some success. Um, I'm honored to be joined tonight with three impressive experts with both functional expertise as well as North Korea specific experience. Um, they include Dr. Naji Shafik, who works as a researcher with the Korea Health Policy Project at Harvard Medical School. With a background in clinical and public health, he has over 35 years of experience with organizations such as the WHO, UNICEF, and UNDP in countries including Egypt, Algeria, North Korea, India, and Thailand. He has worked for um, UNICEF and WHO DPRK and managed the Improving Women and Children's Health in DPRK project, assisted in North Korea's Ministry of Public Health, assisted North Korea's Ministry of Public Health in development of strategic plans for their health sector, as well as comprehensive multi-year plans for immunization. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Judith Mackay. Um, she's a special advisor at the Global Center for Good Governance in Tobacco Control, senior policy advisor to the World Health Organization, and director of the Asian Consultancy on Tobacco Control, a coordinating body focused on information sharing and expertise on tobacco control among countries in the Asia Pacific. She's particularly interested in tobacco control policy in low and middle income countries, tobacco and women, and countering the tobacco industry. And her extensive experience throughout Asia and the Middle East has led her, work, led her to work closely with national governments and other health organizations on formulating tobacco control policies. Um, and our final speaker will be Dr. Key Park. He is the director of the Korea Health Policy Project at Harvard Medical School and a lecturer on global public health and social medicine. Focusing on international security, health, human rights, and health diplomacy, he specifically studies geopolitical factors influencing health in North Korea um, and has led missions to North Korea more than 20 times to facilitate US DPRK physician collaboration um, he also directs the North Korea program at the Korean American Medical Association and is a WHO consultant, largely concerning surgical care and national surgical plans. Before we get to the panel, um, I'd like to remind those who are listening um, that you should feel free to pose questions to the panel at any time. Q&A will be handled via Slido. Um, and audiences who are attending on site can access this question webpage by scanning the QR code at your table. Um, and those who are watching via YouTube will need to connect to the link in the description box. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to get started. I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Shafik first, who will provide an overview of North Korea's public health sector. Dr. Shafik.
Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to give a, a brief background of healthcare system in GPR Korea. By the end of the Korean War, the GPRK developed an impressive set of policies and programs in the social sector, providing free and universal access to health, childcare, education, maternity services, and other benefits. Universal and free healthcare was guaranteed in the country's constitution of 1960 and the public health law of 1980. The public health law emphasizes commitment to a preventive and curative healthcare system and gives special priority to the needs of women and children. Laws covering areas like as care and education of children, prevention of infectious diseases, drug management, and environmental protection. Efforts to expand health service to the majority of the population in the 50s and 60s were achieved in the 70s. The main policy objective then shifted to reducing inequalities in healthcare provision and services for farmers and remote rural areas. Universal access to healthcare was achieved in the 80s. The strength of the healthcare system in GPRK is based on the emphasis on prevention and almost 100% literacy rate for both girls and boys, an adequate number of medical professionals trained on both traditional and allopathic medicine, extending down to the primary healthcare level, as uh, we call it, uh, household doctors, each responsible for about 100 to 130 families, with the health workforce to population ratio is one of the best in the Southeast Asian region. The breakdown of the socialist bloc that started in the late 80s combined with a series of natural disasters in the 90s, had severely impacted the state's capacity to operate its extensive social services and the health service quality deteriorated. The rates of malnutrition increased due to food insecurity. Infant mortality rate increased from 14 per thousand live birth in 1993 to 23 per thousand live birth in 1998 and the under five mortality rate from 27 in 1993 to 55 per thousand live birth in 1998. GPRK had no option but to call for international assistance. Many organizations started their work in the country, which was mainly humanitarian, that focused on the very basic intervention to save lives, like management of diarrheal diseases and acute respiratory tract infections in children, immunization program, management of malnutrition, ensure safe deliveries, and provision of essential medicine and basic equipment. The GPRK basic uh, aim was to get help until the crisis is over and then they would not need the humanitarian agency anymore but of course that changed substantial results were achieved after 10 years of humanitarian assistance review of the health sector experience reveals that humanitarian assistance must be complemented by upgrading the technical and the management capacity of health services The economic sanctions added to the serious economic challenges faced by the country, leading to widespread shortage of medicine and supplies. The majority of essential medicine are provided by international organizations, in particular UNICEF and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. Moreover, and unlike what's stated in the UN resolutions, 
sanctions added more challenges to the work of the humanitarian organizations. The Republic of Korea funded improving women's and children's health in TPRK initially between 2006 and 2009 and extended later. That was the first long-term commitment that would sustain the health gains and would achieve a functional health system. The project focused on four outcome areas of quality improvement, health infrastructure, health management system, and communication. The project achieved substantial improvement in the performance, especially at the first referral level, county or district. Furthermore, the project served as a roadmap for the Ministry of Public Health in the transitions from emergency to development work. After almost three decades of dealing with the UN international organization and NGOs and relative openness exposure, like regional meetings, conference, external consultant, fellowships, study tours, training and upgrading knowledge. Not only the level of knowledge and performance have improved, but also knowing more about the outside world. The health system is in place, However, the way ahead will depend always on the political situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shafiq. Um, the, there's always many questions that come when dealing with North Korea's health system um, that I hope we can get to in the discussion. Uh, but I, I thank you for the overview of the history of this as well as um, what the potential is if we can get the politics right. Um, with that, I would like to turn to uh, Dr. McKay. I know last year, North Korea announced a new anti-tobacco law and has put a lot of emphasis on this initiative. Um, but it turns out there is a longer history here of anti-tobacco efforts. And I think you're one of the few people who actually knows about this. So um, we're, we're very eager to learn from you about your experiences there. So Dr. McKay. Put the mic on, please. Thank you. Um, the outline of my talk, I'll be looking at the um, history of visits that I've made to the DPRK and then looking at tobacco control in the DPRK and then really finishing with the importance of the UN agencies there. Um, my first visit to the DPRK was in 2012 when in fact I had a three weeks holiday all over the North Korea um, uh, peninsula but also met with the Department of Health at that visit. And as a result of that, I was invited back uh, the following year to work as a WHO consultant on tobacco control. And then followed that in 2014 with five days work as a WHO consultant. And subsequently I've maintained contact via WHO. So that first working visit in 2013, um, the main focus of that was a multi-sectoral workshop, which involved the ministers and deputy ministers for most of the agencies, the ministerial agencies in the DPRK. And they asked me to give a series of talks on tobacco, of the problem and what can be done with it, and then followed by very intensive question and answer sessions. Um, the visit at that time, I also visited the Tobacco Cessation Centre, the Breast Tumour Institute and the Sports Centre. We had discussions on tobacco and NCD control with WHO, the DPRK ministries, the UN agencies and other professionals. And as many of you might know, the UN has a weekly interagency meeting, and I was able to address that and have some discussion with them. 
I was asked to review the DPK law on tobacco control, the 2010 law, which was the original law, the action plan for strengthening multi-sectorial cooperation for prevention and control of NCDs, and also the strategic plan for prevention and control of NCDs 2011 to 2015. And when I was there, I distributed many of the that I've written and these were very useful because all of them have only 200 words on any one topic um, on any page so all of the statistics were put into pictures and maps and graphics which were very suitable um, for uh, a non-English speaking group. Um, I also visited the cessation clinic and the sports centre as you can see they asked me to play table tennis not quite up to Olympic standards but I certainly gave it a go so I did a number of visits. And then my second visit to the DPRK, um, in the interim, interestingly enough, I've made some suggestions for starting upgrading the tobacco control law. And these were put into place, for example, more smoke free areas in some of the educational establishments. And again, we had a multi sectorial workshop on tobacco control. I visited the cessation center, the dental hospital, the children's hospital, and again had discussions on tobacco as part of NCD control with colleagues in WHO, the ministries and other professionals and the interagency meeting at the UNDP. And it's really this whole question of the non-communicable diseases is really quite important for the DPRK because the average life expectancy now has increased substantially over the last several decades. And really the DPRK is now running into some of the problems of chronic diseases. Um, apart from that, the UN meetings offer the opportunity for the both Koreas to meet together outside the DPRK. For example, this was in Moscow in 2014 when they had the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, COP6 meeting in Moscow, and the two Koreas come together and have discussion there. So this is why the theme of my talk is actually the importance of the UN agencies in terms of furthering public health in North Korea. So next, looking at tobacco control itself, just what has happened. Uh, noting that they have a 44 male smoking prevalence, which is similar to many countries like China and Indonesia and Asia, 0% female. In all the many weeks I've been in North Korea, I have yet to see a single female smoke. So I think that's probably accurate. But interestingly enough, I found tobacco control strikingly similar to the rest of the world, because after all, it's the same product, it's the same harm, it's the same obstacles and the same action that needs to be taken. So in the DPRK in 2010, they had their first tobacco law, which I show up at the top here. In 2005, they ratified the one and only convention of WHO, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. They have signed on in 2015 to the Sustainable Development Goals. <laughs> And also in 2020, as was mentioned, we, they updated the tobacco prohibition law, as it's called, with 31 different articles. So progress has really been made on this front. But finally, I would really like to look at the importance of the UN agencies. Um, there are four strategic priorities of the UN strategic framework for 2017 to 21. There's food and nutrition security. There's the social development services. There's resilience and sustainability and data and development management. And all the UN agencies working in the DPRK aligned with this particular framework. So in the um, DPRK, there are basically six main UN agencies, the Food and Agriculture um, Organization, the United Nations Development Programme, the United Nations Population Fund, um, UNICEF, uh, the World Food Programme and WHO, the World Health Organization. And I'd like to just run through these one by one to indicate the kind of work that they're already established doing there. Um, the Food and Agricultural Organization supports food security through agroforestry, soybean cultivation, fruit production, marine aquaculture, capacity building, and rehabilitation of facilities related to double cropping, conservation agriculture, <laughs> horticulture and prevention of transboundary animal diseases. Now this sounds quite agricultural, but in fact, many of these, of course, impinge on health, which and public health. 
The UNDP the U, is the lead agency, the lead development agency in the United Nations, and they function in many ways. But particularly, I'd like to look at the Sustainable Development Goals. And number three of the Sustainable Development Goals relates to health. And these, as I said, the DPRK has signed on a commitment to implementing these. The United Nations population um, uh, uh, supports health facilities that provide life-saving sexual and reproductive health services, including emergency obstetric care, distribution of tickets, and support to people in meeting their basic hygiene needs. UNICEF and the DPRK does many things. It focuses on current humanitarian priorities, including ensuring access to life-saving assistance for the most vulnerable people affected by disasters, reducing malnutrition, particularly amongst children under five and pregnant and lactating women, and improving access to basic health and water sanitation and hygiene services. The World Food Programme, each month, the World Food Programme provides specialised nutritious food to around one million pregnant women, nursing mothers and children, helping to reduce acute and chronic malnutrition. Um, these fortified foods include blended cereals or biscuits with added protein, vitamins and minerals. And it targets this assistance to supported institutions like nurseries, hospitals, pediatric wards and some boarding schools and provides support to the factories that produce these fortified foods. WHO is the organisation where I'm a senior policy advisor and where I'm most involved. And WHO's strategic priorities in the DPRK are sustained and equitable universal health coverage with an emphasis on primary health care, again, especially for the most vulnerable and remote. Enhanced services to address communicable and non-communicable diseases and maternal and childhood diseases, especially those experienced by the most vulnerable women and children, and to strengthen health emergency preparedness and response capacity. I'll give you just a very practical example of what I think is an amazing achievement, and that's a child vaccination programme. And this, in fact, was a joint effort between WHO, UNICEF, the in inoculation agencies, Gavi and IBI, and the DPRK government. It includes the pentavalent vaccines, polio, measles, and Japanese encephalitis. And it strengthens the DPRK health system by equipping health centres and training all levels of public health personnel for vaccine preventable disease, surveillance and immunisation service delivery. And it's really also created a dialogue and contact with the people of the DPRK. Um, the UN agencies work, of course, with all the diplomatic missions that um, have a presence in the DPRK. So there's many combined efforts there. So my conclusion for the DPRK in terms of public health, that both to improve public health and the economy, because dealing with NCDs, in fact, improves the whole economy substantially. So improving public health and the economy requires reducing the NCD risk factors. And one proven route is through the UN agencies, their international treaties, their conferences, and again through their guidelines to create a healthy population in the DPRK. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mackay. It's great to um, hear about all of the work that's been done, um, especially in the tobacco sector, where again, this is not necessarily common knowledge. Um, and hopefully in the q and I'll pose this to you now, you can think about it, um, is if you've read through some of the, the revisions that they've made in some of these laws and have you seen some of the suggestions that you've posed over the years um, reflected um, in those laws. Um, but before we get to that, uh, we have one more speaker, Dr. Park, um, who I think many of the audience might already know. He's pretty famous in this field uh, for his work on um, North Korea and especially on surgery cooperation and has led, like I said, more than 20 missions to North Korea for US DPRK um, doctor exchanges. And so, um, Key, with that, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> first, let me. Uh, say thanks to, to, for, to you for organizing this panel and moderating and inviting me um, and also the Ministry of Unification. I just wanna acknowledge both Judith and um, Nagi for their, their excellent presentations. I, I, I would say, you know, there are North Korean observers and there's North Korean researchers 
But I think there are people who are actually practitioners of global health within North Korea, and you've got two, three of them here. And so I think that your presentations are uh, excellent. And I'm actually going to tie in parts of your presentations to, to what I'm going to say today. So I think my take home message is quite simple. Uh, in health, adversaries such as North Korea, South Korea, and the US often agree, right? So I'm going to give you an example of one um, uh, 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 international health agreement, uh, how that came about, and then how that particular agreement, it's a WHO instrument, so Judith, you know, you're, you're absolutely right about how the international agencies, UN agencies, play such a critical role, but how that agreement ultimately resulted in a, into a cooperative project. Uh, so let me take you through this whole process. So there was a resolution uh, in 2015 at the World Health Assembly. Um, it's resolution 6815 calling for strengthening of emergency and essential surgical care as a component of universal health coverage. Now, this was uh, uh, there were a number of co-sponsors and US was a co-sponsor. North Korea was at that time, uh, was on the executive board and, and, and the North Korean health attache during the World Health Assembly spoke very positively why this resolution needs to pass. So, and it passed unanimously. So in, in this case, US and North Korea were in agreement and it actually supported one another to get this particular resolution passed. And what it calls for is literally strengthening of surgical services because it, it's, it's from a public health standpoint, it's a, one of the major pillars of the health system. Now, North Korea followed through with one of the recommendations of this resolution, which was to place into their strategic plan elements uh, of, of this resolution. And it just so happens at that time, Nagi was, uh, was, was a consultant from WHO supporting North Korea with, uh, with their, their uh, medium-term strategic plan for, for the health sector 2016 to 2020. And um, you know, we had a conversation and, and, and he had a conversation obviously with the Minister of Public Health and that made it into the strategic plan. So the provision of the uh, emergency and essential surgical care package at the frontline hospitals. You could imagine a, 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 an objective like that, how big of a project that represents. These are, you know, a hundred, uh, there are tons of frontline hospitals in North Korea. Now, I work at Harvard Medical School in the global surgery uh, program where we actually in, uh, work with a number of ministries of health in, in, in developing strategic plans and implementing surgical system strengthening projects. So we kind of have an idea of what a country like North Korea would cost, you know, what it would cost to scale up surgical services for the frontline hospitals. And we estimate it'd be about $500 million. So Zambia was $400 million. Anyway, I was actually working at WHO at the headquarters as a consultant within the surgery program. And our mandate was to implement this resolution. And, and North Korea being one of the member states, uh, well, were one of the, our, our um, contacts. And we approached them at the Geneva mission and said, we're happy to help in any way we can. Now, uh, we know what happened after 2015, right? The sanctions started to build and, uh, increasingly and, 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 and you know, just the most comprehensive set of restrictions ever uh, in history. And so we had a strategy, I had a strategy of, of how do we get, uh, how do we get this project off the ground? And so there are three uh, uh, state main stakeholders here, the US, North Korea, and South Korea. And I'll tell you how we nudged each one of these countries to sort of come together. So North Korea, we weren't sure about their political will. There are many health, uh, competing health interests. And so they put it in the strategic plan. Doesn't mean that they're gonna actually jump at it. But as a way to nudge, we uh, wrote a report, our, our, our Korea Health Policy Project. It's titled Injuries in the DPRK, the Looming Epidemic. And we highlighted the surgical systems role in dealing with injury uh, burden in North Korea. And we showed that the number of deaths due to injuries is actually higher than all the communicable diseases combined. It is the top cause of death for ages between five to 29 old, near year olds. More than half the uh, people in that age group, when they uh, die, die of injuries. And this particular proportion of uh, the in injuries is growing over time. And then we also did a macroeconomic analysis showing that about 1.5 billion uh, uh, US dollars uh, can be expected in losses as a result of death and disability uh, to injuries. And this was a way to highlight, you know, the why the why we if if you saw this report, it, it, the, the natural question is 
wow, we need to actually prevent injuries, number one, but we need to uh, build our capacity to treat injuries in, in North Korea. So that was sort of a, a message towards North Korea. Now, we need to also uh, nudge the U.S. The truth is U.S. is the gatekeeper for humanitarian exemptions process at the U.N. Security Council. We, we all know that. And, and we also know that they have a very narrow definition of humanitarian aid and any kind of capacity building is and development aid is it has been uh, systematically cut out. And surgical system strengthening involves infrastructure, training, equipment delivery. It's, it's a massive type of uh, package. But what we said, what if we frame this as a way to get North Korea to spend money on something other than its weapon system? So I, know I had mentioned earlier that this, co- this project overall would cost about $500 million. We know from North Korea's experience with Gavi, the Global uh, Vaccine Alliance, that they co-finance on average 20% of the vaccines that are, pro- that are provided to the North Korean uh, children. So what if North Korea is willing to co-finance up to 20% of $500 million? That's $100 million. And that seemed to at least uh, allow U.S. to reconsider it and say, You know, it might be possible if we go province by province, if North Korea is willing to co-finance. So then the final nudge was to ROK. As uh, Nagi mentioned, there was a a project for improvement of maternal and child health uh, uh, over the Park era. It started with uh, Imeon Park era and then made it all the way to Park And it was the first large scale uh, health care, health capacity building project funded by ROK, about $65 million. And Nagi was actually at one point the project manager of this this, this massive project inside North Korea. Now, that project ended in, in, in around 2015 under Park Geun-hye uh, 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 administration. And then when Moon Jae-in administration came into power, there was an interest in uh, re-establishing uh, inter-Korea projects, possibly a re- uh, uh, through an, an area of health. So the, I, the, 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 uh, the, we would say, can we imagine a you know, improvement of maternal and child health pro project 2.0? And I think there was an interest in doing that at the, at the South Korean government. And uh, we said, what if they do it in, in surgical system strengthening? And, and so they took the uh, Venn diagram, surgical system strengthening and maternal and child health improvement, and came up with, why don't we provide funding for improving pediatric surgical care in a province in North Korea? And that worked. And they decided to give $5 million to WHO uh, for this particular project. And I know that the project involves pediatric surgical care improvement in one province, but it also uh, has a, a, a funding to do a nationwide evaluation of surgical capacity so that this could be a, serve as a pilot project. So right now the project is on hold due to the pandemic, but I think there's a possibility of revisiting this, especially if we can uh, uh, look at the, the pandemic preparedness value of providing surgical uh, uh, capacity ventilators, OR space, hospital beds, sterilization equipment, these are all uh, shared uh, resources for pandemic preparedness and surgical uh, uh, system strengthening. So I think that there's some open, there's some possibilities. So in conclusion, I I would say health sector is unique because the enemy is not each other, right? But rather a disease or a virus and creative solutions are not only possible, but essential for cooperation, especially during pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, Key. Um, I do want to remind the audiences that are listening, if you have questions, um, please use the app. Um, You can uh, scan the QR code at the table if you're in Seoul watching this at the conference. Um, If you're online um, on YouTube, uh, there should be a link in the description box um, that you can click to get to the Shlido wall. Um, So please feel free to post questions at any time. Um, and there's the instructions as well. So um, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Mackay, if I could come back to you uh, in terms of the work that you've done on anti-tobacco and when you were there, um, have you, do you see any of the recommendations that were, um, that were provided at that time reflected in the different revisions of the law over time? Oh, you're still muted. 
Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yes, I do, particularly in the area of smoke-free areas. In fact, at the Motti Sectoral Workshop, I had made the comment that schools programmes, anti-smoking schools programmes, traditionally do not work very well. And these are the programmes that speak about, you know, if you smoke, you will get cancer when you're 60 or have a heart attack when you're 70 and so on. Very much focused on long-term health problems. And certainly it's been shown these have minimal effect on 10, 11, 12 year olds. And I had mentioned that these were not successful and we are really still searching, I would say, to find an ideal school program, whether it's to show how the tobacco industry manipulates young people, that's an approach that's been tried and so on. And so somebody in the audience asked me, well, if I was to say, what would be, it was from the Ministry of Education, what would be the ideal program <clears throat> in North Korean schools? And I said, at the meeting, I said, I'm not going to tell you. And they said, well, why not? I said, because unless the schools go smoke free, and that's for the students and for the teachers and all the staff and even parents visiting, unless you have that background template of a smoke free area, you're not going to really make much headway in terms of getting um, a, a reduction of youth smoking because they'll see it as quite contradictory and quite duplicitous, in fact, if you allow smoking amongst all those people. So by the time I went back for the second working visit, um, the Ministry of Education said this were the steps that they started taking, making the education facilities for smoke free. And that, in fact, is reflected in the new law. Um, there are now quite a wide range of facilities that have gone smoke free. In tobacco control, I won't get too specific, but essentially we know what to do. We know what are the best practices. Top of the list comes tax and price. Now, that's a very difficult one in the DPRK because, um, you know, the government is in, in the sense the tobacco industry is in China. Um, the second one is smoke free areas, and that's the one they're really focusing on. The third is trying to ban all advertising and promotion and sponsorship. And again, in the DPRK, this is not very evident. You don't have big billboards or advertisements on television. Um, fourthly, it's cessation. And the DPRK has put quite a lot of resources into that. So I think, you know, some very valuable first steps. And the big difference between the 2010 law and the current law is its specificity. And I think, again, this has been a learning experience into how to draft tobacco control laws. The first law just simply said we'd like to cut down smoking and we hope people don't smoke in public places. Just too generic and too non-specific. But the latest law is much more specific and it's more specific with its penalties. So I think the DPRK is certainly on the road um, to improving the tobacco control. And as I said in my introduction, with the life expectancy going up apparently to near 70, the non-communicable diseases will be the diseases of the future in the DPRK. Once the immunization diseases are solved, once the malnutrition is solved, it, the, ahead of the, the DPRK lies an epidemic of non-communicable diseases. So that's why we need to look at the risk factors, particularly smoking, but also, you know, physical exercise, nutrition and so on and so forth. So I think it's on the right path. Our experience in other countries is that there is no quick fix to this at all. If you get your smoking rates down by 1% a year, you're doing magnificently well. So I think there is a huge improvement and I find that really encouraging. And of course, being a party to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the DPRK attends all the COP meetings. It has to report on a regular basis um, to the FCT Secretariat and that report is published. So this is the whole process of the FCTC is to just commit government, set the template that governments are committed to it and work it forward. And certainly the DPRK is not the last in the world by any means in terms of tobacco control. So I feel heartened, but as I said, there's no quick fix. If you work in tobacco control, you're in it for the long term. And I often say I'm going to be working till I'm about 100. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like that's true of those of us who work on North Korea too. You're in it for the long haul. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. I think that's very important. And again, for our audience, as Key had said, as Dr. Park had said, this is um, an incredible resource of practitioners with a lot of on the ground experience. Um, so I, I do encourage you to ask questions along the way. 
Um, I do have a question uh, for Dr. Shafik and, and Key. As you go through this, um, you've both given some great examples of different types of programs that have been successful in North Korea um, and where you have seen results over time. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what are some of the keys to success? What are, what are some of the, the lessons you've learned and lessons that your organizations have learned along the way um, to help make sure that these programs not only get off the ground, but actually achieve their goals? Um, Nagi, if I could turn to you first. Thank you. Um, well, uh, uh, from my experience, I'm, I'm working in many other countries, uh, working in GPRK was completely different. Uh, it was a new experience and we have to understand the situation, the culture and many things. So uh, it applies, of course, this applies for every country, but in GPRK, there's a special situation also. And uh, there is, uh, when we started there, there, as I mentioned in my presentation that the, the government was hoping that this humanitarian assistance will be over in few years and then send us to the airport, thank you very much, and go back to normal. But things changed. And it's now almost three decades of humanitarian work there in or humanitarian organization and international agency and NGOs working in TPRK. So I think there are many factors that change the situation. But I guess that for myself, my judgment is that the important thing that the decision makers in TPRK realized by time that it wasn't about providing medicine and food. There was something more important they realized. It's about upgrading the knowledge. They realized how much gap, knowledge gap there was there. And they appreciated really the existence of the international humanitarian organization. And that's, I think, what the main reason, among other reasons, that they accepted the existence of humanitarian organization for longer time. I remember that in the beginning also that something like uh, whoever accompany us to the field or uh, dealing with people were impatient with us. Uh, they are not, but we understood quite that this is, it, it's, it's, it's something like new habits for them. They are not accustomed to deal with foreigners. It, it was our existence there made a stress on them. Any mistake for them or anything like that. So it was something new for them. But I think that, again, going to the point that from our side also, we have to be patient. We have to understand the culture. We have also to be honest and straightforward and say what we believe it's, it's right. And we know why we are there. We are not politicians. We are humanitarian workers and we are there for helping people. It is difficult sometimes also to convince politicians about it and decision maker, but with the long term, they or anybody else, they realize that uh, the importance of this dialogue and engagement. I think this is uh, uh, also, uh, there were other things that I noticed uh, in my journey there, uh, almost uh, seven and a half years there, uh, that there was a change of attitude from the, the time I arrived by the end of 2001 until I left in mid-2009. There was a lot of change in attitude and behavior. You can see also yourself, uh, many examples for this. So, I mean, that was also from their side, they were ready to change and, and, and to, to be more open to the world. I get that just for the moment. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Park, do you want to add to that? 
Yeah. So, I mean, there, I got, Nagi is really the expert on implementing projects inside the country because he's been, he was there for that massive project as the project manager. He traveled all over the country. He's been there multiple times. And, 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 you know, not just from that project, but even more, more recently, this couple of years ago for, for UNICEF. And so, you know, and then to be able to work there and then still have good relationship with North Korea says a lot about, I think, Nagi, your, your ability to um, uh, build trust and, and, you know, uh, in relationship with the North Koreans. So he, if he's the expert, let's say, on the implementation aspects, I think my what what I would have uh, I have experience with is putting it together, right, to making it so that it, it becomes possible. And I think Judith is is right on the money. North Korea trusts more, as you say. I don't I won't say they they trust wholeheartedly, but they're more likely to work with multilateral organizations like UN agencies. They're mem they have, they're a full member of it. Um, it's not I don't want to say politicized because it is, but it's less uh, uh, affected by political whims, I think, uh, than other uh, organizations like, let's say, Global Fund. You know, what happened with Global Fund when they pulled out of North Korea in 2018? They went back in, but um, and, and it was it was political pressure. I mean, there's no question in my mind. So so it's the value of international UN agencies. So North Korea has a, has a sort of a, a preferred uh, a desire to work with them. Knowing what their priorities are, I think that's the key. So they they do set their own priorities based on their own values and you know uh, uh, and the burdens and things like that. Then you have to work with the key uh, stakeholders. You know, uh, funding. So they will have to depend on depend on some external funding. And who are the key funders? The, really, the richest funder is South Korea. They have a billion dollars within the uh, the, the Namboo Hamnyo Kigum. Right, it's a it's massive uh, uh, funding. Uh, uh, by the unification. And, and also from, from a funding standpoint, South Korea, it has to make sense. It has to be politically uh, palatable. Uh, so the, finding the areas of, of, of mutual interest between South Korea's needs and North Korea's health, health uh, uh, priorities. And then, and then I think that the, the greatest example is in the, in the US, finding out that their US's security interests sometimes could, uh, 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 you know, so, so the calculus for the sanctions it might be a little bit controversial here, but the, some of the, the, the one of the calculus for sanction is to cut North Korea of all currency, right? They want to sort of cut off their any kind of income, so that's the calculus. So that's all the extra exports are banned, all that stuff. But what if North Korea actually you take their money and have them spend it on something else, right? That's so that's less money they have to spend on weapons and that kind of stuff. So when we frame it that way, I think there's, you know, it, it, you can start getting them to think about, hey, this could be actually, it's, it's good good for a patient, so the, sort of the ordinary people of North Korea, and it reduces the, um, you know, the, the spending ability of North Korean government. So it's all about finding these areas of shared interests and then letting each side know about it. And so I think it's entirely possible to get these kinds of uh, 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 mutually agreed upon health uh, uh, projects you know, off the ground. And, and the surgery is just one example, but there, there, I'm sure there are others. May I uh, just add one more thing? Um, I, I just want to give the example of what we call monitoring. Because this is, a, in the beginning, it was a big problem. We are in the middle between donors and between the host country. And both of them think about monitoring in a different way. They have different definition. Some donors would like us to play the role of a policeman, which is not the case. And the, the, the host country also look at it as I'm um, working as a spy for the donors. So we have to work patiently with the donors and make them understand that monitoring is international definition. It doesn't differ between Korea and any other country. And we are, we have worked in many countries and monitoring means that I will find mistakes. It means that I will help them to correct these mistakes, not to use it politically or to punish them for the mistakes. And then also to work with the host country that what is monitoring? I'm not spying for donors. I'm here to help 
upgrade the knowledge of the workers. It took some time. And luckily, with my colleagues and me, we managed to put a new definition of monitoring that was different for the donors and the host country. Great, thank you for that. Um, we do have one question from the audience so far. Uh, this is from uh, Wan Ki Jung at NK News. Um, I think this is probably going to be key, more geared towards you. Um, the question is on US being a gatekeeper, uh, can you describe the process of getting travel ban exemption since this was just renewed today? Um, and how much time and cost did it take? Was it an easy process? What does that look like? Yeah, we're really sad to hear that the, um, the State Department uh, and Secretary of State uh, Blinken chose to extend the travel ban for US citizens uh, to travel into North Korea, which is the most tragic part is that the families that have, you know, North US citizens who are Korean, uh, U.S. citizens who have family inside North Korea, and they are not able to visit them because they don't fit into these exemptions. We, so I'm considered a humanitarian worker because we can perform surgery inside North Korea, but each time we go, we have to apply as if we're applying for a brand new passport and then make an appointment at the passport agency, go through the whole process. And uh, so so it's it's very cumbersome. Um, I, 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 I do want to address the humanitarian exemptions process, the gatekeeper aspect at the UN Security Council. So there is a process for humanitarian aid organizations to file for an exemptions process through the UN Security Council 1718 committee. Um, mm -hmm. uh, to prepare the, the exemptions request is quite cumbersome. Now the time it takes to get approved has been shortened due to the pandemic, I think within days at some times, but in the past, it would be six, nine months or longer is that it's very sensitive to political whims. What I mean by that is that the sanctions committee works by consensus. So if one country objects, then none of it goes through. So you could have, uh, so US can say, well, we don't want that particular shipment to go in because we're concerned about that. That's it. So they actually have a virtual veto power and it's usually the US and of course their allies at UK and Japan, uh, if Japan, Japan's not always on the Security Council, but UK is that object to these things. And so it can be, they, they tend to, I think, calibrate these exemptions based on the, uh, the political climate, which I think is inappropriate. I'm, I personally think that the exemptions process sh should not exist, especially in times of a global public health emergency like this pandemic. I think all UN humanitarian ag agencies should be given blanket uh, licenses to work without any restrictions. Asking them to seek uh, uh, permission to provide life-saving help is morally absurd. Well, on that subject, <laughs> um, oh, Dr. Mackay, did you have something to add? You're still muted. Um, I realize how fortunate I am living in Hong Kong because we have a DPRK consulate here and it's a very simple matter of just going along and getting a visa and, and visiting the country. And I certainly, I mean, my experience has been of working throughout Asia with every type of government you can possibly think of, whether it be kings or communists or democracies. And I, I think one of the really important things is to be completely apolitical. Um, I just don't get involved with any of the politics. And the truth is, if I were to only work in countries whose governments I really approved of, there may not be too many governments in the world I would be working with. So um, it's very straightforward. I mean, tobacco is the problem. And to me, it's quite a straightforward issue where there's smokers, you know, there go I. Um, I'd just like to make one additional comment to what my other two co-speakers were saying, and that's a matter of training. Because what happens with the WHO agency um, in the DPRK is that they have all the time seconded into them from the Ministry of Health um, two or three people at any one time, uh, working with them for one or two years. And I think that's a really important um, issue in terms of capacity building and um, you know, increasing the, the knowledge and the know-how of, of the Ministry of Health in the DPRK. And finally, I would just say that although COVID is dominating all our minds at the moment, the reality is it's bringing the communicable 
and non-communicable diseases together in a way that I can't recollect any other epidemic in history, because we know that all the risk factors for non-communicable diseases, things like smoking, things like obesity, uh, things like general unfitness, these all make COVID in many cases, easier to catch. It makes it more severe. The deaths are greater amongst these people. So tobacco control is a really important component of COVID management. Um, so I think that, you know, we come together on this. But I agree with the other speakers that, you know, the, the issues are humanitarian. They're not, they should not really be political. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, you know, as we're as we're talking about this, since all of you have so much experience, um, I think one of the questions that comes up is, you know, in the time that you've worked in North Korea, um, what are some things that you've learned that you think the international community, the outside community, misunderstands in the popular narrative? Um, are there specific things that you can point to that? that you found surprising um, or that you were pleasantly surprised um, to find out and that you think should have broader attention? I think for me, it was the, I'd expected it to be a very, in a sense, quite serious country. I had completely underestimated the sense of fun that the North Korean people have, um, the way they joke, the way they, uh, play. And uh, for example, on our very first visit, which was a, a tourist visit to the country, we had two interpreters, both of whom were very heavy smokers. And I did my best. I tried everything I knew about explaining to them the harmfulness of it, you know, the fact it would um, uh, sort of affect their families by passive smoking. None of it had any good at all. And then finally, in the end, I said to them, you know, the two of you are smoking and one of you is going to be going to the other one's funeral because one of you, 50% at least, if not 60% of smokers die from smoking. I said, one of you is going to go to the other one's funeral. And this was the thing that triggered them off. And do you know what they did? They did a stone, paper, scissors. And he said, it's him. He's the one who's going to die. I mean, they have that ability to sort of, you know, to joke and to be happy, to sing, to dance. I mean, the hills around Pyongyang were filled with music from, you know, various players and people singing and dancing and barbecuing. I had actually, before I went the first time, which is now nearly 10 years ago, I had underestimated that sense of fun amongst the North Korean people. Nothing really to do with, uh, what our discussion is on health systems, but certainly to do with health. Great. Uh, Key? Yeah, there, there are so many examples of, you know, perception, reality, mismatch. But I'll give you two, two examples. One is, I think there's this prevailing perception that North Korea is such a poor country that they totally depend on external assistance. Otherwise, the country will collapse. Mm -hmm. That's just not the case. Um, you know, if you look at the total amount of external assistance that they get and on health is, is, is about $25, $30 million a year. Uh, it's been the sort of the number uh, plateaued about a few years. That's a dollar per person a year. Uh, you know, and, and that's, that's nothing. So, so, you know, humanitarian aid, we make a huge deal about it from, from, a, from a big picture. It's, it's, it's not a massive, uh, it doesn't, they don't depend on it. In fact, you can argue they don't really need it in some ways, I think. But where they I think that I want to make sure I qualify this. Where, where that need is important is that because it targets the lowest uh, of the socioeconomic classes, the most vulnerable. So I think humanitarian aid should be uh, provided, but the, the amount is so tiny. The other one is you hear this a lot. North Korea has chosen to abandon its people to build their nuclear weapons and, and missiles. I hate when I hear that because that's simply not reality. Um, North Korean doctors, hospitals, public health officials, they are passionate about maintaining and improving health of their people. And they're they the, some of the finest people I've ever met. And North Korean government, according to our analysis, has maintained uh, uh, about 6.1, 6.2% of GDP spending on health. 
that's that's above their economic peers. And I can give you some concrete examples, like you know, a, a CT scan that they developed uh, as a prototype, and they're using it at one of the ho hospitals. Uh, ultrasound machines that they generate that they developed and used for domestic use. Artificial knee joints, spinal implants. So this is a country that's that's really investing in in in, in the healthcare of its people. So I, I I don't want people to walk away and say, well, they've they've abandoned their the health of their people. That's simply not the case. Just to push back on that a little bit, um, there is always the criticism as well, or the belief that a lot of the efforts that are done on health, for instance, are really ge geared towards the elite and not the rest of the population. Um, how would you respond and react to that? I guess, Nagi, do you want to take that or? Oh, oh yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, if you look at the health system, for example, let me give you an example that I mentioned quickly in my presentation about the, the health personnel. And, uh, you know, in many countries in the world, you can find assigned doctors to work at the first level, but you, you never find them at their place, or they go once a week or something like that, including my country here, for example. This is one of the countries you find dedicated household doctors at the very first level. And they are responsible for families. And in spite of all the difficulties, I tell you something. I was graduated and in the beginning of my life, I couldn't work in such hardship stations like them. We are trained to work when everything is ready for us to work, but they are trained to work even if they don't have medicine, they go to the mountains and make their own traditional medicine. And they responsible for families, for vaccination. They, they work in a very difficult, I mean, for the first level, it's really important to know that there are dedicated doctors living there. Also, I saw nurseries where there are medical doctors working for them. And I saw I remember one of them was in Chongjin in the Northeast. There was a fire once in a nursery and the doctor, he the one saved all the children. I mean, there are a lot of examples that about that. Of course, there are different levels. Like you have the county level, the provincial level, the, 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 the uh, uh, central level. And you can find also people inside the system, different opinions. And this is normal because you can find in many countries not unique about Korea. For example, some people think that the central hospital are the best and should be the best and should be more equipped. And some people see the reverse. So I saw the same people in Korea and outside Korea. So what I mean that they have the basic of good health system. They are trying their best. If their problem because of shortage, because of many reasons we talked about it, it is not done intentionally. So if the situation improves, you will see how they are going to do. They are going to do more and more. Uh, let me just, uh, if, I, if I may, just add also to what my colleague said. Yeah. Uh, 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 as uh, Judith mentioned also, for me, when I went in the beginning, I was under the impression that I'm going to a dark room. I'm not going to deal with anybody. There is, there is, at that time, maybe it's better right now, relatively better, there was media that talked about people there that you even believe every woman and children there are making nuclear weapons. It's something strange. And then when you live with them, you find that they are normal people. You are surprised. They eat, they enjoy, they dance, they, they make jokes and, and they have hopes. They, they cry sometimes. They are human beings like you. And it shouldn't take that much, but because of the media and its stereotyping that created this picture. And I hope that the people will understand that. Thank you, Nagi. Um, this, you know, the, the purpose of this panel was really to talk about different, you know, potential pathways towards peace in using um, 
the, the public health sector as one of these avenues. And, and just to remind people as well, if you have questions, please scan the QR code, use the app, and, and feel free to post questions. But um, one of the subjects, uh, you know, that we haven't touched on yet, um, that of course is the prevailing topic of the times, is COVID. And so, of course, there's a lot of talk about whether there should be bilateral COVID assistance, U.S. or South Korea providing, you know, um, vaccines. Um, what, you know, and, and, and Nagi and, and Ki, you, you did write an article recently about North Korea's vaccination capabilities and what that means. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of room for discussion here on what, is a potential pathway towards cooperation on COVID, not only the vaccine issue, but on all of the other types of technical knowledge and understanding that are necessary for epidemic prevention, managing epidemics, as well as um, you know, uh, further cooperation, disaster management in the future. Um, so maybe if we could move to that realm um, and and see sort of some of your thoughts on what are our best ways forward here to provide some help and assistance uh, to the North Koreans on this issue. Uh, Ki, do you want to go? Oh, Nagi. Ki, yeah, Nagi, do you want to go first? I, oh, I no, go. you go first, and I will. Yeah, so yeah, we were uh, you know we published recently in Thirty Eight North uh, about North Korea's vaccination capabilities, and just to uh, give some statistics, you know they are able to uh, deploy, we think as as many as over three million injections a day, if they have everything in place, and they did that at the last measles outbreak and a national vaccination program. So, you know they're they're not you know just some country that can uh, execute some of these massive public health campaigns, they, they can. Now let's talk about what are, what are some ways to cooperate with, 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 with North Korea. Um, once again, I think the key here is um, uh, 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 they don't want to do bilateral assistance because there could be some political obligations, right? And they don't want to be seen weak when they're dealing with the, the adversaries. So there's a value in having WHO and UNICEF you know, the UN agencies involved here. Um, and then, you know, we know what their intentions are. So when they apply for COVAX advanced market uh, commitment program, that indicated that they wanted vaccines, right? But then that's before all these side effects uh, started to surface and all the realities of these vaccines as they rolled out, the efficacy isn't as good, you know, their breakthrough vaccine, their breakthrough in infections, whether they work on the Delta. So I think there's been a certain amount of vaccine hesitancy on North Korea's part. And until they're convinced that they've identified the right vaccine for their people, I don't think they'll open the door for, for, uh, for the, um, to receive them. They just rejected uh, the uh, Sinovac vaccine that was offered to them through COVAX. They just, they, they, they turned it away. So, you know, there's that vaccine hesitancy. Um, once we did, once they get to a point where they feel more comfortable, I think this could open up some 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 uh, opportunities for provision of vaccines, and most likely have to be through through Covax. I think the the, the best op options are the mRNA vaccines at at the, at the moment, especially the Moderna Pfizer, you know, the two Moderna Pfizer vaccines. They can deploy those um, because there's a special. Uh, 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 there's one provision where these mRNA vaccines can be stored in regular refrigerators for up to 30 days. So if they can deploy those quickly, the, the, the mRNA vaccines uh, might be an option. I'd like to hear what Nagi has to say. Can I just come in before that, though, and just say that today China's announced that it has developed an mRNA vaccine. So, I mean, that's another possibility for the future. It's being tested as we speak. Fascinating. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I totally agree uh, that uh, with Ki about the the current urgent need now that resemble for me an opportunity also for the political solution. Although it's a crisis here with all our all the world living with the pandemic, but it's an opportunity also to engage with North Korea. And, and, and it's good that they have uh, some kind of uh, uh, 
engagement with the COVAX, in spite of the fact that uh, uh, they reject this vaccine or that, it, it, it's not the question here. The question is, I, I think if, if, I, if I were in that place, I think that it's a question of they have a problem also in shortage of medicine and things like that. And they are trying to get the best thing that cannot cause trouble for them. For instance, also, they might think that, uh, oh, okay, if we take this vaccine and some side effects or complication happen, how can we deal with it? So I think they are still studying how, what is the best for them and how can we deal with it. And in this case, I think that our role is to engage and give them the necessary information and help them to take the decision. And uh, I, I just wanted to add also to what he said about the uh, uh, measles epidemic of end of 2006, 2007. I was there and I was really impressed by the mobilization and the efficiency, especially of the Korean Red Cross. They really made fantastic work. Of course, the UNICEF and WHO and uh, IFRC work together. But I mean, uh, uh, it is an example of they can do it if, they, if really they want. And uh, the logistic things that it's not because also there is some kind of mis conception about uh, the, 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 the logistic infrastructure there. Uh, it was uh, assisted by the WHO, UNICEF, and there was, an, uh, was regular inventory for the cold chain equipment from the central level to the first level, and the uh, up, upgrading of some of the equipment, whether vehicles or, or I mean, or means or to transport the vaccines, and uh, also the, a lot of training and uh, upgrading. And, and some people, they didn't know even that they have solar refrigerator there. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of things going on there and the logistic capacity may need just upgrading and some work for a couple of weeks and it will be okay. Um, just uh, just one more thing also, uh, I think also, uh, uh, the, as I mentioned, that the, uh, this uh, pandemic is, a, is an opportunity to, uh, to, to engage also, but we have also to try to think about also other basic and emergency needs. For example, like some, some essential medicine, uh, some of the medic medical equipment that's necessary needed uh, for for children, uh, nutrition uh, supplies that we, we used to treat uh, children with malnutrition, uh, insulin for diabetes, uh, think about the tuberculosis, some other non-communicable diseases. It's good opportunity also if we can consider that also with the uh, vaccines. Yeah, that is important, and, and especially going back to what Key was talking about of clearing some of those exemption um, hurdles in order to get equipment there as well. Um, following up on the theme of, you know, one thing you said before, Nagi, was this idea that uh, approaching um, these programs in terms of upgrading knowledge and not just providing food and medicine. Um, around COVID and, and the whole pandemic response globally, um, what other types of outreach um, should the international community be doing um, that can be done you know, through UN agencies uh, to help the North Koreans not only um, deal with the situation they have now, but, but prepare for future pandemics along with the rest of the, the international community? Well, um, uh, here, um, North Korea, uh, in, in, in they, they are, have some kind of history of dealing with the international agency and UN agency and NGOs. And so far, I know for political reasons, maybe they, they, they don't want to engage in bilateral uh, uh, a relation with some other countries that are willing really to help them. 
So I think that the, 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 the only possible way now is to, to channel all our uh, assistance or through the UN agencies. Uh, because they they have an experience of working with the with with the country, they are trusted, and and it's it's, it's for the time being this is the only way to move ahead. And uh, for example, like let me give the example that I mentioned about improving women's and children health in North Korea that were funded by Republic of Korea, but the fund was channeled through the WHO. or Judith, do you have any thoughts on this? Oh, Judith, you need to unmute. I, um, my only experience of working in the DPRK is with WHO. And I couldn't agree more that it's a, you know, it's, it's been in existence, WHO, since the 1940s. It has in-country presence in most of the low and middle income countries. Um, it's seen as, uh, you know, not specifically political and therefore much more acceptable. I, I, I personally feel that this is a way to go. I, I don't really quite know what um, uh, approaches have been made in the NGOs. I know there was an attempt to set up a university in uh, the DPRK in Pyongyang. Uh, that uh, was basically funded from outside. I mean, I know there have been different overtures, but I, I, my own feeling is it's a true and trusted path um, in terms of just uh, helping, basically. I would agree with my co-speakers. Yeah, I, I just wanted to tell Judith that, you know, Nagi and I, you know, we've been there for, for an over a decade and reduction in smoking, <laughs> you know, especially younger doctors. Um, and then, you know, we used to be able to smoke in the uh, hospital, in the surgeon's lounge. And uh, now it's, you know, it's like, Dr. Park, you can't do that. <laughs> so uh, we're seeing, you know, I, I stopped smoking, by the way, but yeah. Uh, they, they they do. Uh, I, I've seen a, a reduction in smoking smoking uh, prevalence. Uh, it's visible, um, and the culture is definitely changing. Yeah. Well, I'm very pleased to hear that the DPRK has helped you quit smoking. <laughs> and and I, I I was also told that there was a a, a, a for a cessation program. They developed their own patches, uh, yeah. and domestically uh, produced patches. And the and the, the, and the medical group that actually uh, developed it experimented on themselves. So I think it's a kind of a biased study. I mean, you have a desire to make it work, right? <laughs> but is the idea key? that they use the patches themselves to stop smoking, yeah, and good for them. Yes, the cessation center in, uh, in Pyongyang has been very active in terms of producing patches and also tablets that you can take. And in fact, they gave me these tablets to bring back to Hong Kong where I live. And I had the government chemist analyze them. And they said there were many, many natural ingre ingredients. And we really had no data on the efficacy of these. Um, so it was really hard to make any comment as to how effective how effective they were in practice. But no, they have a dedicated cessation center and, uh, and the staff and they produce a lot of literature and posters and pamphlets and things to give out to people who want smoking, quite traditional health education, but still it's there. And so I'm really pleased to see it's having an effect, not just on North Koreans, but on also <laughs> Park as well. <laughs> yeah, and it goes to show you that they're in they're not just doing it to, to, to sort of go through the checklist of what they're supposed yeah. to do from the convention, but they have a, it's, it's a priority for them. Uh, and so they're doing things that are above and beyond just doing, you know, the policy, you know, the, the legislative requirements and those kinds of things. And the most remarkable thing is that the public health in this situation is, 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 is you know, you know who smokes. I mean, you know who smokes in North Korea, right? <laughs> but even he's a, unable to stop this, this you know, the <laughs> anti-smoking campaign. Yes, there, there are examples of other countries where the 
uh, the top leaders are smokers, and yet they understand their responsibility to their people. And they may recognize that they may not be able to stop, but they still feel they have a public health responsibility. So it doesn't entirely negate uh, the possibility of action taking place. It makes it more difficult because it, for all of these things, you do need political will at the top. But um, no, I, I think it's going ahead. It's, it is going ahead. At the very least, they should stop printing photos of him smoking. <laughs> well, actually, interestingly enough, Deng Xiaoping in China, this is what happened with him. He was unable to stop smoking initially, but he then said that he would not, he made comments like he was unable to stop, but, you know, if he, if he was addicted, young people, please don't start. He stopped smoking in public. That was the number one step. And then towards the end of his life, he stopped smoking completely. So, you know, there are, there are various ways. You can get around all obstacles in tobacco control. They're not easy, but there are ways. Great. Um, so we do have one last question. Um, it is, given the unstable electricity supply throughout the country, sometimes even in Pyongyang, does North Korea have viable options for storing any COVID vaccines? I think this one's for you, Nagi. Well, I, um, uh, uh, are we talking about specifically about COVID vaccines or we have experience of other vaccines also? Because COVID vaccines, you have two types of vaccines. The one that need uh, uh, deep freezing, like the Moderna and the Pfizer, and the other one is just treated like any other vaccines. So there is no problem at all because they have a expanded program of immunization and it works for many years now with high coverage. So there is no problem about this. The only thing when we talk about that, we are going to talk about the mRNA vaccines. And for this also, we, 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 we mentioned that in the article, maybe, uh, maybe I, I leave it to Kitu to talk about it. He, he hands the mic to you. Oh, I, I cut, it cut out just for a second. I'm not sure what the question is. Okay, was okay. The, la the last thing I said that because I said that there are a group of vaccines that relate like the other vaccines that have been going on and there is no problem. The, the only thing when we think about upgrading the uh, cold chain is about the mRNA vaccines. So I said that you are going to talk about it. Well, I thought you were going to talk about the solar power, the, uh, the, 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 the cold rooms. And in the, especially in the provinces, their backup, you know, solar power. Yeah, and that's that's a way around sort of these the electrical you know, supply issues. And then you have a way to track that these things actually are working. Yeah, you were, that, that's one of the pictures that you shared with us on in that paper. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was, uh, there, uh, I didn't want to, to go into details because of the time, but anyway, I can talk about it that also that in, in areas that there was uh, irregularity of uh, electric current, there was a deal with UNICEF and their supply division in Denmark that to bring some solar, run uh, uh, solar refrigerators. And also there are some devices kept in the refrigerator that you can track when you go there to monitor the situation, you can track 15 days of, of temperature if you, uh, stick it to your laptop. So, uh, and I did it myself for many, uh, many visits. Uh, but I, I, again, this is for the normal vaccines. But for the uh, for the uh, mRNA vaccines, also, uh, I leave it to back to to talk about it. To 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 to, to Kito. I have nothing to add, and how they would overcome the. The, the power issues, yeah, for the freezers. But well, I do the, know the UNICEF could provide these freezers, but yeah, the power supply issue will still remain. So essentially, if it's not the mRNA, the, 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 there's ways to make sure that there is power provision in order to maintain the vaccines the way they need to be. But with the mRNA, you, you definitely need to have a consistent power supply because of the high um, uh, requirements of, of the cold chain, right? 
Yeah, and, and one more thing also is that when we deal with this pandemic, you don't expect a country like North Korea to get 15 million doses at one time. The maximum they can get at one time is 5 million, and they can do it in one week. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, you know, I, I think that is something that we all hope will happen at some point. Um, but I, I think, you know, as we've seen around the world, uh, there, there's still problems with vaccine provision, not just in North Korea, but in many countries. And, and some of that is supply. Um, and some of that in the U.S., for instance, is really education um, and people being willing to take the vaccine. Um, I think this has been a great discussion so far. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we've pointed out is in terms of building cooperation with North Korea on public health, uh, one of the key ways to do this is really to look at the UN, look at international organizations, look at um, international agreements that North Korea has signed on to and that, you know, that the U.S. and South Korea have also signed on to that are that provide a platform for cooperation and discussion and starting something new that helps um, helps all parties meet their goals, but also helps North Korea um, deliver on their priorities as well. We have just a couple minutes left, and I wonder um, if, uh, if I can provide each of you, you know, about a minute to if you have any concluding thoughts or remarks. Um, why don't we start with Nagi? Okay. I just want to remind history. In 2000, the year 2000, there was an argument around the world about engagement with North Korea, because this was the year that opening of embassy for UK and German embassy there. And there was a lot of argument, if you go back to the news at that time, to engage or not to engage, and some people say we don't engage, some people, and also about international organization also, the situation there at that time was difficult and some organization were fed up with some things and they left. Here today, I want to say one thing, going back to this point at 2000 and now after more than 20 years, engagement proved to be right. And we have seen and witnessed many things. My colleague said about tobacco and, and, and and, and surgical program, many things happen in this 20 years, thanks to the engagement. Julia? Yes, I would just follow by agreeing the importance of the UN agencies, which in fact was the focus of my talk at the beginning. And, you know, I'm lucky in one sense that I'm removed from the political process that clearly colleagues in the US are having to deal with and some of the sanctions and things like that. They, these just don't affect me at all. And, you know, my working with North Korea is utterly straightforward. As I said, I work with kings and communists and democracies. And I think if you work in public health, um, that, you know, the, the main focus is on improving health and it's removed from politics. And I think that the best route for that is definitely um, the keeping engagement and doing it through the UN system. Yeah, so I think one of the most exciting developments is uh, the, the fact that the North Korea has, has participated in the voluntary national review for the SDG progress and SDGs. And the third SDG is, is health and well-being. And there are a number of health targets that are included in three point, you know, in, in the number three, um, universal health coverage, which they actually have, but things like reduction of maternal mortality ratio, infant and neonatal mortality, reduction of injuries and disabilities uh, uh, from road traffic injuries, um, uh, NCD reduction. They're they're all in these targets are all a part of the uh, SDGs. So these we can find ways to cooperate to help. North Korea achieved these targets. And I think this would be a, a great opportunity to engage them. Thank you for that. And I think, you know, it's great to have some specific examples of areas in which North Korea has made commitments, has goals set, um, and, you know, is part of international efforts to, to achieve those goals and that really do create pathways towards cooperation um, that will help improve 
the global health situation overall. Um, I want to thank each of our speakers for joining us tonight. I know it's uh, different time zones for everyone and, and some very inconvenient times for, for some. Um, so I really appreciate your joining us for this really important conversation. And, um, you know, I hope that we can continue to think in these ways and provide some ideas on, on how to create new types of cooperation for everyone. So thank you all. And... Have a good night and good morning, good day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.